By now, you're probably familiar with the Schrodinger equation and how wave functions evolve, how particles behave in potential wells, and even the classical particle in a box problem. But here's the thing. Schrodinger's equation assumes that the world moves slowly. At high speeds near the speed of light, we need to include Einstein's special relativity, which unifies space and time into space-time, and shows that energy and momentum behave differently. These aren't just quirks that are critical, and trying to merge them with quantum mechanics led to a revolutionary new idea, antimatter. Einstein's theory of special relativity, introduced in 1905, rewrote our understanding of space and time, and it established two key rules. The speed of light is constant for all observers, and the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. From this, we get the time dilation, length contraction, and most importantly, relationship between energy, momentum, and mass, which is E squared equal MC squared squared plus PC squared. Any quantum theory aiming to describe fast particles must obey this relationship. Schrodinger's equation just doesn't, so let's revisit it. In the Schrodinger equation, which governs non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which looks like this, here psi is the wave function, V is the potential energy, and the Nabla squared or Laplacian operator represents spatial variation. The kinetic energy is P squared over 2m, which only works at low speeds, and so this equation doesn't account for special relativity or spin. To make quantum mechanics relativistic, we apply quantization rules to the energy-momentum relation. Replace E and P with operators. Plugging these E squared equal MC squared squared plus PC squared gives us the Klein-Gordon equation. This equation is Lorentz invariant, meaning that it respects relativity, but it only works for spin-zero particles and leads to negative probability densities not suitable for electrons. Paul Dirac proposed a first-order equation in both time and space to solve this. His goal was to come up with a relativistic quantum theory for spin-half particles, and he proposed this thing right here. So here, psi is a spinner, which is a four-component object, and gamma mu are the gamma matrices. The genius? Squaring this equation brings us back to the Klein-Gordon form, but with positive probability densities and spin included. Now, the reason this works is because gamma matrices are basically 4x4 four four matrices that satisfy the anti-commutation relation. This ensures Lorentz invariance, and the anti-commuting property means that gamma mu, gamma nu, plus gamma nu, gamma mu equals 0 for mu not equal to nu. This lets the Dirac equation remain linear while encoding spin and relativistic symmetry. Spin ors represent spin half particles and transform differently from regular vectors under rotations. Dirac's four-component spinner includes spin up and spin down versions of both the particle and its antiparticle. Solving the Dirac equation gives both positive and negative energy solutions, which is weird, so to fix it, Dirac proposed the idea of a filled sea of negative energy states. Knock an electron out, and you're left with a positively charged hole, the positron. In 1932, Carl Anderson discovered this particle. It was antimatter, predicted purely by theory. And the Dirac equation not only merged quantum mechanics with relativity, it revealed that nature includes mirror particles for everything we know. So what started as a fix to the Schrodinger equation led to one of the greatest insights in physics. Dirac's equation weaves together quantum mechanics, special relativity, and spin, and it predicted antimatter. It shows how mathematics can guide physics, sometimes revealing truths we hadn't even imagined. If you enjoyed this, hit like, subscribe, and let me know what you'd like to explore next.